the radical idea, the revolutionary thing wasn't the shots fired at Lexington and Concord. The revolutionary idea was saying that all people are created equal. It's not just the royalty, 640 families that own 95% of the land in Britain, for example, but that anyone could own land. This idea of what a person was, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, that's the definition I'm working from. And what Jefferson said at the end of this long debate between these people is that a democracy cannot live without an engaged populace any more than a monarchy can function without a king. And yet here we are in a democracy without an engaged populace. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group. The Village Square, a nervy bunch of liberals and conservatives who believe that disagreement and dialogue make for a good conversation, a good country, and a good time. At the Village Square, we talk about politics, religion, and race. You know, the topics your mom taught you never to discuss in polite company. Listen, at the Village Square, we make pigs fly. Welcome to Village Squarecast. This is Corey Nathan. So glad to be with you again. Thank you for joining us for Authentic Patriotism with Stephen Kiernan. Funding for this program was provided through a grant from Florida Humanities with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Check out Florida Humanities online at floridahumanities.org. That's www.floridahumanities.org. This is both an encouraging and a convicting talk about both the problem and some solutions for our civic engagement. It, it's so easy to get caught up in what the extremes are saying from one side or the other. Our speaker, Stephen Kiernan, certainly addresses that, but he also talks about some very doable solutions to this sort of ailment that plagues too many of us. And whether you're a congressman or a governor or on the city council or an engaged citizen like me, we can do this. We can do this. I won't give any spoilers for Stephen's talk just yet because I think you'll really appreciate what he has to say. So now let's turn it over to Liz Joyner, who we all know and love, our trusted founder of the Village Square, who introduces Stephen Kiernan and this inspiring talk. This season, we've taken a hard look at the problems that divide us, and we felt that we owed you an optimistic solution. So here it is tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce our special guest all the way from the beautiful state of Vermont, where it's slightly cooler, author Stephen P. Kiernan. Stephen has written two books, Authentic Patriotism and Last Rites, Rescuing the End of Life from the Medical System. Um, over two plus decades as a journalist, Stephen has won 40 awards, including the Gerald Loeb Award for, fin for Financial Journalism and Joel George Polk Award. He's involved with the Young Writers Project. Just ask him about it. He would like to tell you about it. He is also an accomplished musician, has recorded three CDs in music for theater and television. Apparently, Stephen doesn't sleep. Stephen. Thank you, Liz. Hello, everybody. Nice, nice living room we have here. This says, authentic patriotism restoring America by taking action instead of taking sides. If we're going to talk about uh, taking sides, I think the first thing we just need to get out of the way is I need to tell you where I am politically, so then you're going to be all comfortable when we go forward from there. Some people are left wing, some people are right wing. I am right down the middle of the bird. That's a joke. They laugh at things like that in Vermont. Um, even though I'm going to talk about some very serious things, you're allowed to laugh. <laughs> um, no, I'm delighted to be here um, and in Tallahassee. And um, I've been able to meet with some terrific folks in the course of the day today from the human services community and other parts of the, the, what you folks have going on here. And it's unique. And I'll tell you why this event is unique in a minute. But first, I want to tell you a story about a fella named Jack McConnell. There's Jack, smiling Jack McConnell. Jack was the son of an itinerant preacher who hitchhiked from community to community in Appalachia 
preaching in churches like these. And Jack would hitchhike along with his father because he could play five songs on the piano. A mighty fortress is our God, what a friend we have in Jesus, and so on. And they would do these revivals. Oh, and Jack's mom had an extended illness when he was a young boy, and so he decided that he would be a physician. And he had a great career as a physician. And at the end of his career, he decided that he wanted to retire to Hilton Head, South Carolina, where he would be visited by his grandchildren. He'd eat in nice restaurants with his wife, and whenever he wanted to spoil a perfectly good day, he would chase a white ball around, something like that. Well, Jack was in the habit of picking up hitchhikers because he'd been picked up so many times. And whenever he picked up a hitchhiker, he would say to them, do you have health insurance? And they would always say no. 100% of the time, they said no. So he and a couple of guys in his foursome decided that they'd conduct a survey. And they hired a survey outfit, and they found that there was a whole population there on Hilton Head, people who had jobs. They were the greenskeepers. They were the waiters in the restaurants. They were all working folks. They just didn't have access to health insurance and therefore decent, appropriate, and preventative care. Here we have a nice subset of a classic American problem. Easy to solve, right? Maybe not, but he found that there were as many as 8,000 people in that community who might need uh, health insurance. So he had an idea. He said, why don't we create a free clinic and we'll make it staffed by all the retired doctors and nurses that live in this community. There are tons of them. In fact, there are 300,000 retired physicians in America and there are 750,000 retired nurses. So this is an idea that might have some legs. And in fact, he got so excited about it, he hired an architect to do a rendering of what he thought this place would look like, the Volunteers in Medicine Clinic in Hilton Head. Now, you would think that the government and the business community would get behind this because of the problems that we have in our healthcare care so, Oh, she was the first one to laugh. Now you get to some jokes. Very good. In fact, what happened, well, let's think about it for a minute. Harry Truman was the first president to say we're going to create universal access to health care in the United States. We're now 12 presidents later. We haven't quite accomplished it. 37 Congresses later, we haven't accomplished it. It's okay. Botswana has universal access to health care. Did you know that? They've had it for three years. We'll get there. Really, we will. But it's okay, because it's not just government that has failed to deliver on this. The free market has had all the years since Harry Truman, too, even though it's been incredibly expensive to the business community to pay for their employees' benefits and to have uh, the taxes that support, support state and federal health care programs, and even to have employees not show up for work because they didn't have health insurance and didn't get good pre preventive medicine. So again, you'd think the government of the free market would say, hey, here's somebody who's finally figured it out. Let's get that free clinic going. And instead, not only were they neutral, they were obstacles. The state of North Carolina said, and South Carolina said, how can we license a physician who's, spent his, who's retired and spent his whole career in another state? Federal government said, how can we license a clinical care facility if we can't control the place with our hands on, our purse, stri on the purse strings? Meanwhile, the, the, the public, the, the, the uh, private sector was saying it's going to take $3 million a year just for the malpractice insurance in this place, and who's going to pay for the bandages and keeping the lights on and all these things? Pretty good questions, pretty good obstacles to solving the problem. But Jack had a couple of things going for him that uh, maybe helped him. One of the things is that he was the most charming person you'd ever want to meet. You are the smartest person I ever met, and that's the best question anyone asked me, and how are you doing today, beautiful? And behind that, he had a spine of steel. He was not going to be deterred. He had great bedside manner, but he was still a hardcore physician. He also was in an affluent community, so raising the money for a clinic to try this idea was going to be easier than in some other places. He also had an ability that gets to his personality, but to draw people together and say, there are a lot of problems on the way to this, but where do we agree? Where can we make some progress because we agree? Let's hang on to that question. We're going to come back to that in a minute. More important than any of these things, he had an idea about America, where we shouldn't have so many people who don't have access to health insurance, where we ought to have appropriate care, where if Botswana can do it, for peace sake, we should have done it a generation ago and where an individual can make a difference in solving a problem. And he was determined to do it. Well, who do you think won? There's a picture of Jack outside the Volunteers in Medicine Clinic. Kind of looks like the drawing, doesn't it? And it turned out, in fact, that there were about twice as many people who needed help in that community than they thought, because there was a whole unknown population, the immigrant population, right? Um, 500 people a year who are non-medical now volunteer at this clinic. They do paperwork. They greet people at the door bilingually. They manage the, the appointment schedules and so on. All kinds of unexpected side effects. Truancy virtually ended at the high school because kids get better soon and get back to school soon. Homelessness went down because fewer people were forced to choose between paying a medical bill and paying rent. All kinds of positive side effects. Now this next slide, I just want you to be careful because you're about to see me practice math without a helmet. But I think it'll work here. 
The local hospital, before the Volunteers in Medicine Clinic opened, used to do a million eight in free care every year. After the clinic opened, they did a half a million dollars a year in free care. And the clinic only cost $800,000 a year to operate. So in addition to covering every human being in Hilton Head, they saved a half a million dollars. So it didn't just make humanitarian sense, it made economic sense. And by the way, if you go to Hilton Head, if you visit there, and you ask people about it, everyone in that town knows about Volunteers in Medicine Clinic, and they are proud of it. They say, this is a problem America couldn't solve, and we did. And they have a sense of being in a special community. In fact, it's been inspirational to other places. Because the economics makes such great sense, you can do clinics like this in other places. In fact, Jack founded the Volunteers in Medicine Institute. And today, there are 84 of these clinics around the United States treating about 900,000 people a year, including seven clinics in the state of Florida. Now, 900,000 is not all 49 million people who don't have health insurance, but it's a pretty good down payment. And I can tell you, it feels pretty good to those 900,000 people to keep their jobs and not lose their homes and get back to school and be well and not be in pain. Now, I love this story because it confirms a sense that I have as America is a special place, that one guy can say, I'm going to change things, and lo and behold, he can do it. And if he's a really good leader, that there'll be really good followers that help him make it happen. But I'm about to give you five minutes of completely depressing data about ways in which America is maybe not so special as you think. We think, oh, America's got the strongest economy on Earth. In fact, our economy is so strong that all the manifestations of our pastimes and, and leisure entertainment is also the largest on Earth. But in fact, it's not quite the way that we think it is. In fact, America's not quite special in the way that we think it is. And if you compare us with the other developed nations in the world, there are a couple of measures where we don't look so good. In fact, there are a lot of measures where if you compare us with the rest of the developed world, we don't look so good. Yeah, how about that? It's very sobering, actually. Now, let's do a quick quiz, just to make sure you're with me here. There are 305 million Americans, roughly. How many of them, their only income is food stamps? Not a nickel beyond food stamps. How many? Shy people of Florida. OK, it's 6 million. If you, then you can just shout these out. I'm sure you've got them right off your fingertips. Um, poverty. How many million Americans are living in poverty? Just first, first stop. Before you think about that, think about how long it takes you to burn through $22,000. OK? This is a family of four, 22K all year. How many Americans out of 305? Somebody give me a guess. 25 million, that would be just a catastrophic amount. Except that it happens to be almost twice that much, and there's 17 million right on the edge. Oof. And then I said the number before, so you ought to be able to do this one. How many Americans without health insurance? Of course, we know 49, that's right. We know that everyone in Great Britain has access to health care, and everyone in Italy, and Spain, and Germany, and Canada, and Botswana. We'll get there someday. Now here's the one that gets me the most. You know, you get a little over 3.6 million people who are homeless in the United States in a given year. Just think of this. When I say the word to you, homeless person, what do you envision? Here's a person who's been deinstitutionalized. Here's a veteran with PTSD. Here's somebody with drug and alcohol problems or a criminal record. And it's a gray beard. And he's wearing nine layers of clothes. And he's pushing a shopping cart worth it full of stuff, right? In fact, increasingly, homelessness in the United States is about families. And there are people who get a medical bill and can't pay the rent or they're in a low-wage service industry job, and so they can't handle it. If the car breaks down, they lose their job, and so on. Anyone want to guess? What's the average age of a homeless person? Yeah, some really good, tough guesses here. Nine. Nine years old. How about that? Now, I wish I could say that Florida is the exception, but there's the news, folks. 86,000 people not not uh, having a place to sleep tonight. Now, I don't know how it is in this state. In Vermont, homelessness is a huge, huge deal because you know, we, get, we get 40 below in the middle of winter, and so if somebody's homeless, they die. So that's a big, big deal for us, and I'm imagining it is here too for different reasons. And there's a lot of work underway here, as you probably know, to get these folks decent places to sleep at night. The point of these numbers is not to depress you. The point is to drive home that need is no longer something that exists on the other side of the tracks. Need is now woven right through the center of the fabric of our communities. We are one car accident and job loss away from bankruptcy, all of us. In fact, the leading cause of bankruptcy in the United States right now is medical bills. It's not credit cards, it's not gotcha mortgages, and that includes for people with health insurance. Number one cause of bankruptcy. Now I'm afraid there's a bigger problem than that. 
which is that the mechanisms that we have relied upon historically to solve our problems for us, to fix these things, no longer can do so. The government can't help us anymore. I'll give you two numbers. It'll tell you why. $14.1 million, that's the amount of money that is spent on lobbying just in Washington, not the states, just in Washington every working day, Monday through Friday. $14.1 million. So someone in there, some 10 cents of that is advocating for that nine-year-old, but my guess is that kid's voice is getting drowned out by all the other interests that are being represented. And then that other number, that's, that's a trillion, 14 trillion, 356 billion, 429 million, 947,000, et cetera. That's the national debt. That was yesterday off the internet, so it's already $4 billion low. The point is, even if the government had the ears for that nine-year-old, it does not have the wherewithal to solve that problem. We are not gonna see a nationwide housing development project in our lifetimes, are we? So government can't solve the problem for us. Excuse me. Meanwhile, the free market, you know, we used to think a rising tide lifts all boats. If we just have economic growth, it'll be fine. But in fact, what's happened is we have global markets for labor and capital, which drive down access to capital and wages for labor in this country. And the result is we've had an enormous concentration of wealth. There are lots of different ways to slice this data. The bottom line here at one is the most recent number. That, that, that number came out four days ago. That, two, that, that almost two-thirds of the income growth in the United States from 2002 to 2007 went to the wealthiest 1% of the population. A rising tide no longer lifts all boats. The economy grows, and a few people prosper, and lots don't. And that's part of how you get the problems that we have. But that's not the biggest problem of all. And when I get to this point, I always like to say that it's always darkest just before things go completely black. <laughs> and if I haven't depressed you by now, you, you know, you've been having too much lemonade and not know what you're putting in it. The biggest problem, I think, is one of national attitude. That the government is somebody else. That if we could just get rid of that guy that I disagree with, everything will be fine. Well, there, there's, there are political systems that do that. They're called dictatorships or monarchies. But in a democracy, that guy's not going away. And above all, that the well-being of the country is somebody else's job. So we should throw the bums out, because if we get some other bums in there, well, they'll fix it for me, and I won't have to turn off the TV. And anyone who disagrees with me is dumb and immoral and probably funny-looking. You know, people say that about funny-looking, but, you know, here it is. That's actually John McCain, the baby that Sarah Palin is, is you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's one level of discourse. But let me talk about some very serious manifestations of those issues. We are now less connected in our homes. We are less connected in our neighborhoods. We are less connected in our faith communities. More than a quarter of the states have got secession movements underway. We've had an explosion in hate groups, and this is before we had an African-American president. And you know, the New Oxford Dictionary puts out a word of the year every year, and their word in 2009 was unfriend. A little bit it's a Facebook joke, a little bit it's a very sad commentary on how disconnected we've become. Okay, that's the end of the bad news. Now I'm gonna talk about the good news. What I think we can do and ought to do about this. I have a phrase for it, but it's for lack of a better one. You have an idea of it in your heart or you wouldn't be here. The phrase I have for it is authentic patriotism. Now, there are a lot of ways that people have tried to define patriotism in the last generation or so. And so I'm gonna talk for a second about the definition that I work from, it's not mine. It was created during a very um, impassioned exchange of letters over literally 40 years between three men, uh, a very kind of quiet, dour uh, Massachusetts attorney, John Adams, and uh, um, a physician, in Philadelphia, most people haven't heard of, Benjamin Rush, and a uh, farmer and uh, architect and philosopher from, from Virginia, Tom Jefferson. And these guys argued a great deal about what patriotism was. You see, part of the reason we got rid of Great Britain was the king, right? And the tyranny of not having representation in parliament. But that was only a small part of it. The bigger part was this new idea of what a person is, endowed with inalienable rights, that's pretty different from the king saying off with his head, isn't it? <clears throat> the radical idea, the revolutionary thing wasn't the shots fired at Lexington and Concord. The revolutionary idea was saying that all people are created equal. It's not just the royalty, 640 families that own 95% of the land in Britain, for example, but that anyone could own land. This idea of what a person was, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, 
That's the definition I'm working from. And what Jefferson said at the end of this long debate between these people is that a democracy cannot live without an engaged populace any more than a monarchy can function without a king. And yet here we are in a democracy without an engaged populace. So there are all these manifestations of people's arguments about what authentic patriotism is. Here are a bunch of things that it isn't. Okay, everyone has an opinion. You know, there was a guy in 1775 in pub in Boston who had an opinion that he could mutter into his pint, but he wasn't one of the guys who got us independence, was he? See, I would argue that it is action, that it is a belief in this old-fashioned idea of a more perfect union, and that every single person inside our shores, legal immigrant or not, since we are all immigrants, uh, is needed. So let me tell you about some people. Jack McConnell. Um, oh yes, a footnote here. When I talk about the issues in America and about patriotism, I don't mean to overlook this stunning and staggering amount of need that exists on the globe. But what I'm saying is, we need to get our own house in order. In part, so that we can preach to others without being hypocrites. And in part because if our house is in order, our ability to help others becomes infinitely greater. So, let's talk about some authentic patriots for a moment. Um, uh, let's start with jails. The nation on earth that imprisons the most people is the land of the free. We incarcerate black people at five times the rate of apartheid South Africa. <coughs> you see the numbers there. And I don't know what you think about that bottom line there, that we still have the highest violent crime rate in the world. Some people say, maybe we should try a different approach to criminal justice. And that's sort of one pole of the thinking. And some people say, maybe we need three strikes, you're out. We need to be tougher on crime. We need to build more jails. And that's sort of the other side of the spectrum. So let me take one correctional facility and talk about what happened there. It happens to be the largest penal institution on the planet, Rikers Island in New York City. Uh, 13,000 inmates there at a given time, 150,000 people there in the course of a year, budget of 1.7 billion dollars. It is so huge that every time the Staten Island Ferry retires one of their boats, they just tie it up to the pier there, you can see in the lower corner, and, um, and convert it for another 800 beds, okay? Now let's talk about a first time offender there. This is typically a young minority male, he's 18 years old, he has been homeless. He has be experienced physical or sexual or verbal abuse, neglect. He may have had parental incarceration. He may have had parental death. He has certainly seen lots of violence. He's never had health care. Um, when he has, he gets sentenced to, let's say he does a breaking and entering, he gets sentenced to 180 days. And two days before he leaves, he gets a pink sheet of paper that says, here are the resources that are available to you. And he gets, a ch he gets $20 in cash, and he gets a Metro card worth two fares. Good luck. And as a result, nearly three quarters of those young men are back within 90 days, and that begins a cycle of incarceration for them that lasts, on average, 10 years. So now they're 28, 29, 30 years old and starting, and they don't have a high school diploma, and they, um, have, all they really know is the criminal justice system. So two people, two women, said, this is not good. First of all, these people are committing more crimes. So there's an enormous cost to the community in our sense of safety and security in our homes. The second thing is, it's pretty expensive to these offenders because they're losing 10 years of their lives, and it happens to be the 10 years in which it's going to determine what the course of the rest of their life looks like. And by the way, it's really, really expensive to taxpayers. One bed for one year at Rikers Island costs $82,000. So if you've got these guys there for 10 years, you're talking about $820,000. So they decided to try something different. <coughs> Excuse me, they started meeting with these young men well before their time was up and saying them to them things like, um, do you have a place to live when you get out of here? Um, do you need to see a doctor? Have you ever in your life been to a dentist? How are you going to eat? Where are you in your education? And what they found is that they could just connect them with existing resources for housing, for food, and for medical care, and that, that made a difference, but that the number one deficit was education, so they created a school, the Friends of Island Academy. Now, the Friends of Island Academy now treats 500 students at a time, and the reoffense rate, instead of being 72%, is 5%. How's that? And by the way, if you look at the math, that program is expensive. It's 7,500 bucks per student, but look at the savings. It makes humanitarian sense, it makes economic sense, and that's not counting all the crimes that were committed. And that's not counting the people who, instead of being in jail, have jobs and become constructive taxpaying members of society. And it's not talking about the security that people have. Just dollars and cents, it's a good idea. And the fact that it happens to help 500 young men at a time, that's icing. Jennifer Estes was 35 years old and a publicist in the theater business in New York when she was diagnosed with the same disease that Lou Gehrig was, was diagnosed with at the same time, ALS. 
Now, ALS is a particularly uh, difficult disease. It's considered um, untreatable, uncurable, and only a little bit is known about the cause. Um, what it affects is, the, is a, a cell in the body called the motor neuron. We're going to have a brief science tangent here. Um, the motor neuron is the, the thing that comes from your brain to out throughout your body and tells the motor, the muscles, how to work. It's actually an elegant uh, uh, kind of design. If you had uh, the nucleus of a motor neuron with this room, the end of the cell would be somewhere around Atlanta. Okay, just to give you a sense of proportion. And what happens with ALS is that these motor neurons die back like a vine that hasn't been watered. So you lose the ability to move your fingers and toes, and then your hands and feet, and then your arms and legs, and then you can't swallow, and then you can't speak, and then you can't breathe. And the whole time, your cognition is perfectly intact. So it's just like a prison. It's about the most horrible way that a life can possibly end. No known treatment, no known cure. If you have a great idea for treating this, or if you have an idea for a cure, here's how it works. You fill out a 50-page application to the federal government. Most people spend four to six months filling out that application. About nine months later, you find out if you got your money. Then you do all of your research. You're competing with every other lab in the country for the research money and, of course, for the research that you're doing, so you don't tell anyone about it. Then you submit it to a scholarly journal. Eventually, it gets published. And, and um, because of this model, the advances in ALS were so little that even though it affects the same number of people as cystic fibrosis, it got one-tenth the money that cystic fibrosis research came up with. And in fact, this disease has been known for 200 years, and they haven't really made much progress at all. So one of the things that's promising about the treatment of ALS is that, that, that if people are injected with stem cells, they will turn into no, new motor neurons. So if you can put stem cells in somebody who has ALS, maybe they can grow new motor neurons. I didn't know that that was a tongue twister until I just tried new motor neurons, new motor... So, um, but the problem, of course, is that stem cells are controversial because they come from embryos. And in fact, there's been a lot of debate during the Bush administration. There were resignations and firings and replacements in the President's Council on Bioethics, right? We had um, uh, lots of limitations on stem cell research that could be done in this country because people who believe in the sanctity of life said that you can't kill an embryo, right? And so, in fact, a lot of the research was going on in Great Britain. There was an exodus of scientists from the United States. This is not good news if you're a 35-year-old Jennifer Estes or her sisters, who she was very close to. And what she and her sisters did was found something called Project ALS. And just to, so you know, they call themselves the amateurs. Jennifer worked in publicity, Meredith worked for a bank, and Valerie was a starving writer, okay? Not exactly what you consider the credentials to be groundbreakers and revolutionaries in the idea of scientific research. What they did was decide they would throw dinners. And they would throw dinners like this, except they'd do it in very fancy ballrooms in New York City, and at every table they would have a celebrity that Jennifer had worked for. So you get to sit with Ben Stiller, and you get to sit with Gwyneth Paltrow. And people will pay $1,000 a seat for that kind of a dinner. And so they had one dinner, and they raised $900,000. And they said, maybe this will work. They, they weren't even a 501c3 yet. They put together an advisory panel that was the best minds and research in the country. And if you apply, you write a four-page letter or shorter. The panel sits down and looks at your idea. And if they like it, they vote on it. One guy, from when he wrote his letter to when he got his check, was nine days. OK? And the only strings they have attached are that once a quarter, you must sit down with every other lab that is working on this problem and tell them everything. Everything you're trying, everything that's working, everything that's failing, everyone must work together on this, okay? We're not all going to be adversaries. And the result of that is that they now have found that mice that are injected with, that, have, that are given ALS, they're injected with stem cells, they walk again. They've, in fact, they've found five other animal tests that are going to work. So the result is they've made more, made more progress in the eight years since this was founded than in all the research time before it. They're going to cure this. They also figured out when they had the different labs working together, and I'm talking like Jonas Salk and Johns Hopkins and Harvard and Columbia, all of them, they found that they could take a, a skin cell from you and turn it into a stem cell with your DNA. And the result is, did you notice the stem cell debate has gone away? It's because they made it moot. No embryos involved anymore. Your stem cell, your DNA. Time Magazine called it the scientific discovery of the year. And this model of collaboration is so effective that it's being done in all kinds of places now. Some of the folks that are doing the most amazing stuff with it is the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, which is for people with spinal cord injury. And they are gonna, they're going to fix that in the same way that these folks are going to fix ALS by this forced model of collaboration. They were not able to come up with the cure in time to save Jennifer's life. But that only led the two sisters to redouble their efforts. The amateurs are now giving away about $15 million in research. 
they're going to they're going to cure it. It's going to cure it in most of our lifetimes. The toughest disease out there, because they collaborated, because they had an idea that an individual and her sisters can make a difference. Now I'm going to get into some some thin ice territory. I'm going to have a sip of lemonade before I do it because this is a tough one. And while I do it, I would really love it if you would keep track of your emotions, because I'm serious. Because I'm going to talk about abortion. There's nothing like saying the word abortion in front of a room full of people to make it, you know, you hear the crickets. It gets very quiet. We all have very strong views about this. My guess is that I'm not going to change your mind, whatever it is. My guess is you're not going to change my mind, whatever it is. But I want you to watch your emotions and the anxiety you hear when you hear me say I'm going to talk about abortion and what happens in the next five minutes. First, let's look at how this country has discussed and weighed the issue of abortion in the last generation or so. Well, first of all, any time that is someone is nominated for a judicial position, their views on abortion come up. It comes up in most election campaigns. There have been many, many state battles, and what these all really add up to is many, many fights, parental notification, when it can occur, required sonograms, required counseling, and so on. Right? That these are every one of these things is becomes a, a fight over a hair of the debate, and people get so passionate about fighting about that hair, and this is what happens in our political discourse. Okay? Meanwhile, this is what happens in public. Not exactly showing our democracy at its finest. I'd argue we ought to be ashamed. Now, remember this slide from before? I don't know about the funny-looking part, but those other components, pretty similar to how people feel in this issue, that the people they disagree with are not only wrong, they're immoral. Right? Either they're murderers or they're telling women are trying to limit what women can decide about their own bodies, right? Well, let's see what it's accomplished. In that time, the rate of unintended pregnancies in the United States, well, it's the same last year as it was in 1981. We are still the worst in the developed world in unintended pregnancies. We are still 30% above the global average, including all the third world nations. We've been fighting about this for 30 years, and we haven't moved the needle one inch. One inch. All that shouting, all that ink spent, all that blood spilled, we have accomplished nothing. So let's think for a minute. Let's use the Jack McConnell approach. Where do we agree? And if, with the deeply held feelings that we have, where do we agree? Can we agree that children should not be getting pregnant? Whether they have the child or they have an abortion, can we agree that somebody who's 15 years old should not be getting pregnant? Okay. Maybe that's a place we can start. And suddenly, the areas where we disagree get a little less important if we pick an area where we can agree. Well, in fact, Dr. Michael Carrara took exactly this approach, and he said, "I want to look at what we can do to reduce teen pregnancy in a very small subset of a population at risk for this in New York City." And he put together a nine-step program, and he stayed away from the wedge issues. He wasn't handing out condoms. He wasn't preaching abstinence. He actually called it birth control from the neck up. What do you want to do with your life? What do you want to make of your life? What are your ambitions for your life? Are you thinking about college? Are you thinking about finishing high school? You want a good job? You want a boyfriend who sticks around? And uh, and really avoiding all the wedge issues. And the result was a 50% reduction in teen pregnancy rates. So we tried it again with a larger sample, 48%. Tried it again, 52. Tried it again, 51. Always about basically cutting it in half. And so this organization came along, the Children's Aid Society, and they said, "Can we create?" A citywide program because we have a real problem with teen pregnancy here in New York, and he said he'd be delighted to do that. And in fact, they've done it now, over and over and over. Now there are nine cities trying Michael Carrera's model for teen pregnancy, and they're all the cities with the highest teen pregnancy rates in the country: Baltimore, Philadelphia, Houston, Jackson. Uh, I can't remember the rest of them. And、um, the point is to build a national model. This research is underway right now, and、uh, my guess is you're going to see pretty good return on that. This guy's able to deliver it. Now the interesting thing is that the Children's Aid Society that launched this program for her, him, a classic liberal do-gooders, totally. The funding came from the Robin Hood Foundation, which is hardcore conservative Wall Street capitalist guys. They don't call their their their, their donations well. What they call their donations is venture philanthropy, like they think like venture capitalism, right? The point is, when they began to talk about where we agree, they were able to move the needle. And I would argue that our future is not with the people who are dug in and trenched on one pole or the other, 
of this debate, but in the Michael Carreras. And as you hear this, how do you feel? It's different, isn't it, than when you hear abortion and go, oh, I'm ready to stand my ground, let me dig in. Right? It's, it's, it's maybe a relief. I think, um, I think I'm going to skip these people even though they do amazing stuff because I need to talk for a minute about what I think my piece of it is. Um, because I've been kind of preaching about this for the last year and a half or so, um, I thought I really needed to get some skin in the game. And so um, I created something called the B1 campaign. And you all see some B1 buttons at each of your places. And the idea is this. If you admire authentic patriots, authentic patriots don't just admire them. B1. And so the argument I make is that everyone in America over the age of 10 ought to give three hours a week to some enterprise that doesn't benefit them. And I've made it easy. This is a website. Right? Everyone's got to pitch a website. I don't get any revenue from this. All it is is um, a volunteer matching program. You put in your zip code. You put in your interest area, the environment, healthcare, education, etc. You put in what group, age group you want to work in, and you search, and it'll give you the 50 nearest volunteer opportunities. You know, about a little over 30,000 hits in a year. So people are checking it out. It's just an easy way to find, as if you don't know where the needs are in this community. I bet you do. And I bet you know what you have to offer. But if for some reason you don't, you do this and, and your wheels will get turning. Now, when we talk about the benefits of service, typically we think like, oh, here's the person who's receiving the service and they benefit. They get a meal, they get a place to sleep, they get some health care. I want to look at the other side of it. I want to talk about the benefits to the person who provides the service. The benefits to you if you provide the service. This is a survey that was done last year of people who had never been volunteers before, and then they volunteered for a year, and they got asked at the end of the year what their experience had been. 53% increased self-esteem, 57% more part of the community, 75% happier. If you were to describe what I, what I, the bad numbers I gave you before and the disconnection of people before as an illness, here's the prescription. Here's the medicine. Here's the connection. Here's the re-engagement. Here's the engaged populace, as strong as a monarchy. So here's what would happen if everyone over the age of 10 gave three hours a week. First of all, they'd have the benefits that that poll found before. Second of all, it'd be an army of volunteers. So all that bad news I was sharing before would have to diminish because there were so many people working on it. Third of all, the economic benefit in addition to humanitarian would be the equivalent of creating 19 million nonprofit jobs that'd be worth a little better than two points on the GDP, which we would all benefit from. And the idea, of course, is if you're willing to be one, and you'll be one, and you'll be one, and I be one, then maybe we could begin to be one again. And what happens is communities that make a difference on these things, they begin to feel the strength that they have in making a difference. I spoke with a man this morning who provides elder services, and I guess there was some pretty intense heat a while ago, and they did a little campaign and got some publicity, and now he's got more fans than he knows what to do with. I think, good for this town. Look at how you're able to help those folks. Then, also, if you have leadership, whether it's finding a cure for ALS, or it's building a clinic, or it's developing a teen pregnancy program, that then government at the free market can follow your lead. Look, if Michael Carrera can, can nine cities with the toughest rates of teen pregnancy can cut them in half, probably that would be a good national model. Probably we ought to throw some federal money at it and find some money for it because it will end up saving us money if kids don't have kids, right? If we, can, if we can get all 50 states to have volunteers and medicine clinics, probably the federal government ought to get behind that and the states ought to support it. But it's gonna be in a different order where the people are leading and the government and the free market follow. I guarantee if Project ALS comes up with a drug that treats ALS, that the pharmaceutical industry will be happy to buy the rights to that drug and bring it to market, right? Government and the free market will follow if the people lead. And suddenly we put things back in appropriate proportion. We don't need to throw any bums out. We just need to take charge ourselves. Okay, now comes the really good news. Since I gave you all the depressing news before, authentic patriotism is everywhere. Let me give you some examples. Higher education. You know, um, Teach for America is a program that takes kids from uh, the, the, top, the top students at the top colleges and universities in America and has them teach for a while um, in the most needy communities in America. And since this was created, um, they have served 4 million kids, 27,000 teachers in it. This year, 10% of the graduates of Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Georgetown applied to this program. 
And what they're finding is that the, those kids in the low-income communities who by 10th grade are typically one year behind their peers arrest, around the rest of the country, when they have Teach for America teachers, they catch up. Well, Teach for America started as Wendy Kopp's senior thesis in college. How about 350.org? Have you heard of that organization to build international awareness of climate change issues? That, that, uh, they had an event a year ago, October, that was um, shared in 108 countries to draw attention to climate change, five college students and one faculty advisor. Here in this town, 50,000 hours a week of volunteer time from the students at the university. One interesting thing that they do here, um, if, you're, you're, if you participate in service learning, it's now on your transcript. So it's part of your permanent academic record. It's a credential. It's a credential that gets you ahead. So higher education, one place where it's the norm. The other one is endurance sports. You know, I don't know this community that well, but I'm willing to bet that within 50 miles of here this Saturday, there's a 10K run for some cause, or there's a bike ride for some cause, or there's a marathon for some cause. It's become a part of business. Raising money for charity through sweat is now as ordinary in endurance sports as starting guns and finish lines. And then the fraternal organizations, we don't always think about, but the Elks and the Shriners and the Rotaries and the uh, Moose and the Lions are doing unbelievable things. 13,000 kids right now, orphans, who are being fed and housed and educated by those organizations. It's happening. It's happening in more and more places. It becomes the norm in each of these cultures. And the question is, how can we take what is something that is a norm for the subculture and make it the norm for our whole society? And I think there's some interesting things that are happening here in this community. This is an unusual conversation that you're taking part in here. And I can't wait for the dialogue part of it later because I think it's, it's unusual on a beautiful summer night for people to come together and think about these things instead of staying home and thinking it's the other guy and if we could just get rid of him, if we could just get a new senator, congressman, president, whatever. Instead, you folks are here, it's unique. And, and the fact that you have the local newspaper involved in this Community Hands program is fantastic because it means that people are going to learn in a very human way about what the needs are and therefore find in a very human way how they can make a difference. And then there's this. To think for a moment about an, an issue that you feel really strongly about and there are people in this community who feel really strongly the opposite way, just think for one second about where you might agree, where you might have some common ground somewhere between the two of you. Let's say that they're great advocates for school choice and you think there should be no testing in the schools. Well, then maybe you could agree to do something about a 24% dropout rate. Let's say that they believe in physician-assisted suicide and you believe that end-of-life care counseling is the equivalent of death panels. Well, maybe you could agree there should be greater access to hospice care and palliative care. And it's funny how often we think there can't be any kind of middle ground. We can't possibly agree when, in fact, it's the opposite. There's tons you can agree on. One of my favorite stories from last year is I've been following a Habitat for Humanity project very closely in my community. And there were two guys who worked on this house from the 1st of May into the middle of November. And I happened to be there on a Saturday in November, and these two guys are putting the roof on it, on this house. And, um, and they found out that the previous, that the election had been the previous Tuesday, and they found out that they had supported different people for governor. They'd been working together for six months up there, and they didn't know that one was a Republican and one was a Democrat. And it being Vermont, the Democrat won, and <laughs> that's how it is up there. And they were teasing one another the whole time about, you know, I'm going to push you off the roof. And the rest of the project, somebody mismeasured it because you're a Democrat. You know, they, can't, they can never measure right, you know. And it, it's, it was, they, they teased one another all the time. Suddenly, their politics were an appropriate proportion because it happens all over the place. Okay, one more story. And this one involves a choir. And I'll tell you in advance that the moral of the story is that we can do more. Whatever we're doing now, we ought to do more. Oh, I can tell it's going to be too loud, buddy. You're going to ease it back. But it's a great choir, and I'll tell you the story. And the story really is about one of the areas where we have the most work to do in our culture, and that has to do with relations between the races. In this case, this story starts with a Cicero race riot, which you can think of as, you know, eight months before Rosa Parks, okay? A guy moves into the all-white neighborhood of Cicero, Chicago. There are riots by the white populace about that. A black man has moved in. The all-white police department decides to do nothing about it. But there's some people in Chicago who think this isn't right, that these race riots need to end. And as I say, it's sort of, it's beginning the thinking that leads to Rosa Parks not giving up her seat. And so what they decide to do is um, hold on United Nations Sunday in uh, the church in Hyde Park um, a children's choir that is as multi-denominational, multicultural, multi-socioeconomic background, as diverse as they can make it, and it's a huge hit. And afterwards, 
the minister of that church, Christopher Moore, says, that was great, that was really uplifting, but it was really not enough. We can do more, and I can do more. This is Christopher Moore conducting a choir. I love the fro on the kid behind him, sort of tells you the era that we're in. So he did some homework on what conditions were like for the minorities in America. And they found that when it came to educational opportunity, it was simply not the same educational opportunity that he'd experienced growing up in St. Louis. Um, and the people who did finish schooling, they had a harder time getting jobs, they had a hard time keeping jobs, they had a harder time being paid a, de paid a decent wage. And he said, I'm gonna do more. And so he created the Chicago Children's Choir going into schools and bringing kids together of whatever background and common purpose of singing together and singing at an extremely high professional level. This is so successful, it is now the performing arts education in the school systems of Chicago. 3,200 kids singing together, and once a year they all come together in Millennium Park and they all sing together, and it's really something. Well, the more that he learned about the conditions of minorities in America, he found out that even people who finish school and make a decent living, they have a harder time getting a decent home, and they don't get a fair shake when it comes to qualifying for a mortgage. What's more, when people in the minority get to the end of their lives, they're much more likely to be in a nursing home of substandard quality. And he said, I've done a lot so far, but I can do more. And so he created neighborhood choirs. The best singers from each of the schools brought together in the larger choirs, the neighborhoods, higher quality, and suddenly they're creating more diverse audiences because you have kids coming from more backgrounds. Very inspiring for the people that went to it and very hard for the kids, something they could really aspire to and be challenged to it. He really asked a lot of them. Well, the more that he looked at conditions in America, the more he realized that the experience for minorities is simply not fair. It's simply not just. And even though he'd already created those neighborhood choirs, he needed to go further, he needed to do more, and so created the concert choir, the best of the best of the neighborhood choirs, and they have performed all over the world, not only manifesting what is possible when people join in common purpose, but singing songs about it. So you will find them in Hiroshima on the anniversary of the bomb bombing, performing jointly with the Japanese choir. Uh, here they are last year, uh, performing in North Korea as musical ambassadors of the United States. Um, here they are when they followed the freedom train um, and, uh, route and they're singing at the end of this. They're not saluting him because he's black, they salute him because he's got the best voice in the choir. In fact, they sang on the balcony where Martin Luther King was shot on the anniversary of his death, so it makes complete sense that eventually they would come to the place where King articulated most poetically and forcefully the idea of racial equity in the United States. And here it is, they're manifesting it, judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character and the ability of their singing voice. This is the idea of authentic patriotism. This is what it's like to join in common purpose. If you want to know what it sounds like, it sounds like this. issue. Everyone is needed. Please be one. Thank you. Thank you Corey Nathan back here with you. I don't know about you, but I honestly got goosebumps listening to that choir at the end of this presentation. There's just something about voices literally resonating you, you know that 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 ring that you hear in those perfect harmonies it it just smells me i it gets me and what they were singing about is so true isn't it as much as so many of us like to act like the lone wolf like uh rambo out in the jungle we actually need each other the the choir sang I need you to survive. I need you to survive, which loops back into what Stephen was advocating so clearly on these most difficult topics or issues. How about we start with what we can agree on? 
as much as it seems like everything is an either or battle, all contentiousness, the truth is that most of us actually have so many shared values, so much that when you strip away the partisan battle cries, we could come to realize, oh, they love their kids too. Oh, they love their family too. They really value life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness too. So we could start with what we can agree on and go from there. And with that, it's time to close out today. Please consider joining our members and supporting this programming. You can become a member for just $7 a month or $76 a year, and your business can join for $250. Go to villagesquare.us slash donate to join today. That's www.villagesquare.us slash donate. While you're there, sign up for Village Square's newsletter to stay up to date with everything happening at the Village Square. Go to villagesquare.us and scroll to the bottom for that sign up box. Lots going on, so you won't want to miss it here in 2024. Funding for this podcast was provided through a grant from Florida Humanities with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Florida Humanities or the National Endowment for the Humanities. We appreciate you listening to Authentic Patriotism with Stephen Kiernan. Until next time, we challenge you to reach out with an open heart and mind to someone who doesn't look or think like you. It changes everything. We'll talk to you soon, and thanks so much for listening to Village Squarecast. Squarecast.